uh, don't plan on attending that as well. Uh, in the foyer, we do have a sign up for our Valentine's banquet. Um, please sign up for that. It will be February 10th, uh, Sunday evening at 6 p.m. Uh, so please sign up for that. You must RSVP by uh, February 3rd, which I believe is next Sunday. Um, all right, I think that's all the announcements I have for you at this time. Go ahead and stand and greet your neighbor. some helpers up here with me this morning to help lead us in worship with the first song. If you make your way back to your seats, you got to be standing for this one. This is, I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, okay? And we're going to invite you to sing and clap along with us. And also, one little announcement plug in here. I want to start a children's choir, so if you think your kids would be interested in that, come see me right after the service, okay? Here we go. children's sermon. Good job, y'all. Well, good morning, kiddos. I'm going to have to, I'm gonna, actually, I'm just going to stand up today because we're all over here. So today we are uh, finishing up in our, our study in Proverbs. Have y'all been reading along? Probably so, right? Every day. Uh, well, there's three types of relationships we're going to talk about. Let me see which one interests you most. Who's looking for a spouse? Okay. Who, who's about to uh, move into a new house and pick a neighbor? Now, how about friends? Do y'all have friends? Okay. You know the Bible talks about having friends? You know there's two types of friends you can have. A good one and not so good one. Do y'all have good friends? What does your good friend do with you? Y'all play? Does your good friend get you in trouble? 
your good friend does get you in trouble. That, see, this is what we might have to figure out how to get you to pick some friends that don't get you into trouble. Because that, that's what it, it, the Bible says, iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. And that means the friends that you run with either put you in the right direction, so let you, helps you do good things, or put you in the wrong direction. See, like these two, this is how troublemakers get started. Uh, and it starts when they're little because friends can stay with you for a lifetime. So it's, it's helpful to have friends that help you go in the right direction for the course of your life. So let me pray for you today. Our dear Heavenly Father, I lift up these children to you. I, I pray that as they grow that they will find those in their lives that will push them in the right directions. That will uh, help correct them out of love when they are, are going the wrong way. But also will walk with them through those tough decisions of life. It is in your name we pray. Amen. So today's scripture that we are sharing with you is from Romans 15, 13. May the, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This morning I was got my phone out and I started looking at things, you know, that you do on the phone. And the thing that I was watching was when military people come home and the joy that, that the family just, man, they just go crazy. So, you know, so you know what happened there? My heart got super tender because I just didn't watch one video. I just kept on and on, you know, and it just makes me think, man, what is it going to be like when we see Christ? Is it us that's going to go that, that crazy when we see him, or is it going to be him? Or is it going to be a combination of both? Anyway, I, I just hope that today when we're here that, that you're able to, to find a way to try to experience some of that. So let's go to Lord in prayer. Father, you are my God, your Lord over all, and today we seek your face, just yours alone. You are not the God of despair, nor the God of darkness, but the God of hope. I long for that hope that only you can give. I do not ask for a small portion of what you can give us, or just a glimpse of it. But Father, we want you to fill us completely, fill us to the brim of our souls. I specifically ask for your joy to fill me completely, Lord, but not just for me to look for joy from others, but may that joy not waver because of the trials that I go through, but it's all because of you, Lord. Father, my request means nothing without faith. You know you're able to provide me with joy and peace. I believe that you are good and that you want good things for all of us, and I believe, Father God, that you love us, and I pray for my unbelief. Father, when you graciously give, you give very good. You do so with abundance. You are not the God. You are the God of all riches and glory, and you freely give above all that I can ask for or comprehend. God of hope, I ask that your spirit fill us today with peace, joy, power, and hope from on high. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. you'd like um this song you heard us sing it for the offering last week living hope and i invite you to sing it with me this morning it's such a beautiful testimony of what christ has done for us just reflect on these words as you're singing them how great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name darkness your loving kindness tore through the 
Oh God, you are our living hope. We just want to praise you this morning, Lord, because you and you only 
are the only one who has set us free from the chains that bind us, God. You declare victory over us, over our sin and our shame, God, and we don't have to hang on to that this morning. So I pray that we would lay everything at your feet and just continue to worship you because you are worthy. Amen.
God, thank you for this morning and this time we can come together as your church, God, this place that we can come and worship you freely. God, I pray that through this time, God, that you're speaking to our hearts, and God, through this offering, that you just bless us to, to do your work, to grow your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
you kids for the help this morning with our music. It added a little something special uh, to the service today. You know, life is a series of choices. And our choices follow us wherever we go. For instance, um, you, you may have noticed some sparkle in the carpet today. <laughs> Life is like that, and that's our choices. They follow us. Which Sunday school class they came out of, where they went to the bathroom, all that kind of stuff. And that's why we've been studying Proverbs. That's why we've been studying it to start off the new year. The book of Proverbs isn't a promise that if you do these things, the, this outcome will happen. It is based on human observation. It is based on divine wisdom that had been imparted so many years ago that is still relevant today. Now, those who have been able to keep up with reading through this book, you realize after you get past the first few chapters, it becomes hard just to breeze through your reading for the day. It requires you to stop and to think and to ponder at each verse. Some of the verses uh, after series after series have nothing to do seemingly with the one before. But it's ultimately about following the path of the wise and avoiding the path of the foolish. And today as we turn to uh, Proverbs 27, we are going to focus on four verses, but the main one, verse 17. It's about relationships. So verse 14 tells us, Whoever blesses his neighbor with a loud verse rising early in the morning will be counted as cursing. We need an amen on that one. <laughs> it's true. You know, I raised chickens for a little while. You order, uh, you can order them, you know, hens, or you can order them roosters, or you get a mix. I ordered a mix because some of them were for eggs and some of them were for, for something else to eat. Um, and so, one thing you learn about roosters is they, they kind of do like the cartoon does. If you've never had chickens, they, they, they crow, and they'll, they'll wake you up, daybreak, something startles them, they'll crow. But just about every time you have a new set of roosters, there's always that one. That one that will just start crowing, middle of the night, 2 o'clock in the morning. If they're far enough away from your house, it doesn't bother you that bad. But if they, they kind of meander and end up outside your bedroom window, that rooster becomes your favorite delicacy the next night, doesn't it? <laughs> but that's what it's talking about neighbors. Neighbors are good if they know their boundaries, if they stay in their property, if they, they speak to you at the correct times of day. But neighbors can be troublesome when at all hours of the night they are, are making noise, keeping you up. You know, I imagine that this one probably matches with some of the other proverbs about avoiding drunkenness. Because it's that neighbor who comes home at 3, 4 in the morning after spending the night with friends and becoming very merry with spirits, as you could say, that is happy to greet the one who slumbers, because that's when they are supposed to slumber. But for those of us who have had neighbors like that, I remember a friend of mine, he had a neighbor. He didn't say words. He had a Harley. <laughs> he did shift work. He didn't like that neighbor too much because he was getting ready to go at 2 o'clock in the morning to get to his work. Rev up that Harley. <laughs> and you can't own a Harley without exchanging the exhaust pipes. I think that's an impossibility. For those who have motorcycles, you know, if you drive a stock bike, you're not really a motorcycle guy, are you, or gal. <laughs> but we have neighbors that can treat us this way. In verse 18, it says, A continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. <laughs> to restrain her is to restrain the wind or to grasp oil in one's right hand. <laughs> quarrelsome wife, that one comes up all the time. If you felt read through this series, over and over it talks about the quarrelsome wife. 
Now, you've got to remember the context. This was written to uh, boys, basically, that were going to become leaders of Israel. So we could easily uh, translate that in today about a spouse. Quarrelsome spouse. Now, I've created a quarrelsome spouse at times, and I know exactly what this proverb is talking about. But a dripping faucet, do you have those? Have you ever had that drip, drip, constant drip? You can hear where this proverb is coming from. But then the one I want to look at today, verse 17. Iron sharpens iron as one man sharpens another. Third relationship here. It is who we keep company with. And if you can put yourself in the mind of this young future leader that is reading or studying or being taught these Proverbs, you can see the importance of verse 17. Because if you are going to lead a nation, you surround yourself with advisors, ones that you can trust, ones that you can listen to, ones that can give you advice. But ultimately, your choices reflect on you. And that's how life really is for all of us. We surround ourselves with all kind of people. They will give us advice. They will point us in a direction we should go. But no matter what their suggestions are, angles are, these kind of things, it is ultimately our responsibility for the choices we make. Just as glitter on a project that brings joy to a young child can follow you through the halls, the choices you make in life can follow you, some to the end of the road. Now we study the Bible. We found a faith in Jesus Christ. And we can return to these Proverbs to help us make daily decisions. But all of these decisions are grounded and rooted in a faith in Jesus, the one who redeems. So I tell you today, no matter what decisions that you have made, whether good or bad, especially those bad ones that you have made and that you are living through, Christ can redeem those. You may have missed the path that he has laid out for you. You may have had a clear sign from God that you were to do such and such, but you didn't. Out of fear or out of whatever other reasons that you could justify your actions, you chose the wrong one. We know when we've done it. We have regrets in life. Unless you are one of these children that sang this morning, you probably have regrets in more than one. But God can redeem those regrets and bring you back to the place that he has in store for you and to an outcome that he has laid out for you. But we always want to justify our decisions. And there was a question one time to Jesus. You find it in the chapter in Luke chapter 10. And you're probably familiar with this story, but if you want to follow along in your Bible, Luke chapter 10 Verse 25, it says, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, Who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down to Jerusalem from Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. So likewise a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went, went to him, and he bound his wounds, pouring oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn to take care of him. 
And the next day he took out two denarii and gave, him, gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the one who fell among the robbers? He said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and you do likewise. The reason I share this story today is because of out of the three relationships, the wise seek a good neighbor, a good spouse, and a good friend. We don't necessarily get to pick who our neighbor is, do we? We get to pick who our spouse is, but sometimes we've made a mistake. We may have picked the wrong one, but we have committed for, before God to live with this person for the rest of our life. I don't read the teachings of Jesus to say, well, if we've made a mistake in the past and we've got that quarrelsome wife who's worse than the dripping rain or the, the you can't do anything with, I don't read that to say, well, start over. Just scrap that relationship. Find the one that you should have gotten in the first place. Your decision has been made. A covenant has been formed with this relationship. Now, I'm not saying if you are in a dangerous situation and you need to get out. That's not what I'm saying at all. But if you are just in a relationship that you are struggling through, we can't justify these scriptures to say it's time to get out. We can pick who our friend is. You know, society has changed a lot. How many friends do you have? Go back a few decades ago, not very long. You could probably name all your friends. But now with the advent of social media, with Facebook and Twitter and all these, you can have friends and followers. And there is a new term that I would have never thought of years ago. You can unfriend somebody. You can. You can unfriend them. In our technological advancements, we are more connected to, than ever to people around this globe. We are in a global community. Things that happen in China affect the economy in the U.S. Wars that break out in the Middle East and skirmishes are broadcast on cell phones. You don't have to wait for a political coverage. It's there, right there on YouTube. And all these things. But the more and more we are connected to others, the more and more isolated we are becoming. I was reading a story from a pastor. And he said their church started a website. They're a very tech-savvy church. And this website was a place to anonymously post things that were bothering your heart. Either sadness, either anguish, regrets that you have made, kind of a, a place to offer confession or a request for prayer, but it was completely anonymous. Meaning you could put whatever thing you were struggling with and you had anonymity. People wouldn't know what you were going through, but you could get that weight lifted off of your chest. And he said it was extremely popular. Thousands upon thousands visited this site to share things that were laying deeply on their heart. But do you know one thing that bothered him? How isolated has our world become when we don't have a friend that we could do the same already? But let's go back to the story of a neighbor. We can't pick who our neighbor is. But we can choose how we live as neighbors to other. Jesus was asked this question, well, who is my neighbor from a lawyer who was looking to justify himself and find the wiggle room and the loopholes to say that he was living the right life because he had the law of Moses and he lived by it. He knew that he was to love his Lord, his God, and he was also to love neighbor as long as he could limit who the neighbor could be. He wanted to pick who his neighbors he had that he could love. So Jesus tells a story of someone who fell victim to robbers. It could have been any one of us here today. 
when we travel along the way, when we get out of our comfort zone, out of our own counties, we may not know the roads or the town as well as we should, and we go down the wrong path, and then something happens. We are victimized. We are stripped of our possessions. We are left alone. You know, many of us, we, we become too attached to our modern conveniences, our cell phones, our GPS, and our cars. I have a question for you. What would you do if you were in a strange place and somebody took away your GPS and your cell phone? If your parents still live in the house you grew up in and you were raised in my generation, you probably know their phone number. I even know the phone number of my grandparents, even though some of them have been disconnected. Because back in the day, when I was first born, you know, you had this thing that you turned to dial. And then you got fancy when you had the push button. And when I was in high school, you had the, the hamburger phone. But I had to dial the numbers. And after you're dialing the numbers to the people you cared about and talked to enough, you, you, you knew them. But now with cell phones, somebody says, give me your numbers. You don't even actually have to tell them your number anymore. You can just hit send my contact information to that person. They don't even have to look at your number and they can accept it, hit one more button and they have stored it in their address book. If you lose that, how do you call for help? They don't have pay phones anymore to even use. Even if you could scrounge some, some quarters up or, or dial collect. Do you all know what collect is? <laughs> you can't. You know, I can barely remember my wife's cell phone number. And the only reason I remember it is because I've had to fill it out on so many forms filling up things for my kids. If I only had one kid, I wouldn't remember it. I got five. That's a lot of forms to fill out. <laughs> we can't pick who our neighbors are, but we can choose who becomes our neighbor and how we are neighbors to others. And so in this story that Jesus told this lawyer, this famous parable of the Good Samaritan, we see a priest a Levite and a Samaritan. If you recast those positions today, you could say Baptist pastor, a deacon, and an illegal immigrant. That's how they viewed them in their eyes. The one that you would not have expected to do something took care of any one of us that has fell victim to robbers. And so in the Proverbs, as we study them together, it is important how we work, it is important how we pray, it is important that we find good relationships. We need to be good neighbors to others. We don't need to be that neighbor who bellows in the wee morning hours. Blessings. We don't need to be that one. We don't need to be that quarrelsome spouse. If when you see your spouse, you have been dreading that conversation, you have been stewing over something that happened days or weeks before, ladies, I hate to tell you, but the guys don't remember it. We don't remember what we did, but you're mad about it. Sometimes we wish we could remember. Fortunately, I don't have many of those, right? <laughs> Good thing I brought my own car today. <laughs> so here's a challenge. We can't go back and redo the choices that we've made in life. We just can't. We can ask God for redemption. If your first marriage didn't go through, maybe it was your fault. Maybe it was something you did that was unforgivable. 
and it faltered. Many years go by and you've reconnected and you found a new love of your life. Well, if that is you today, don't screw this one up. God can redeem your relationships. You stay strong with the one you call your spouse today. Don't be that spouse that is the quarrelsome one in the relationship. Because you are no better than a drippy faucet. Drip, drip. In the wee hours of the morning like the neighbor blessing you. Be a spouse that, if, that you want to live in the room with. Not build on a, a garage apartment or something like that. But in the same room. If you're a neighbor to someone, we're neighbors to all kinds of people. Whether we are bound to them geographically, they're literally our next door neighbor. Or we come across them on the street. We are bound to people. It doesn't matter if you've been educated in the scriptures or if you're fairly ignorant. It doesn't matter if you're a leader in your church or you're an outsider. You can choose to be a neighbor. You can be a neighbor that Jesus speaks of because that is what we have been called to do. Do you remember the question of the lawyer? Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? The man had the knowledge. He knew the correct answer. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor. He had the knowledge. But see, this is where it breaks down in the book of Proverbs. We can know the right answers. We can ace the test. You may be taking a test to be a police sergeant or a firefighter, and you may have all the law down pat. You ace the exam. But you're not going to become a firefighter or a police officer unless you can choose to go to where the danger starts. If you hear gunfire, do you hit the ground or do you investigate? Well, you can answer the question, oh, if you hear gunfire, the policy of the police department is to go call back up, blah, 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 blah. We see how that plays out on the news when you have people hired to protect children at schools and they are trained and know the answers that they are supposed to go towards this horrible thing that has taken place. We see the coverage of when they freeze and they wait instead of doing what they were called to do. You do not protect and serve if you do not engage the difficult situation. You can't save anybody's life by answering the right question. If this type of structure is on fire and you have these kind of things to do, how do you enter the building safely and retrieve uh, victims that are trapped in a burning building? You may know the right procedures, the right type of equipment you need, the things that you have, but when you get to that house that is burning or that structure that is on fire, if you don't go inside because of the risk, you're not a firefighter. There's many things in lives, in our life, that we can know the correct answer. But the only way we can choose to be wise is that if we know the correct answer, and we do it. It's all about the application. We can see a neighbor in need. And we can know that we should respond because we have the resources to help them, as this Samaritan did. This Samaritan in our situation wasn't helpless. He had provisions to take care of this man who had fallen victim. He had bandages. He had the oil and the wine to, to care for the wounds because he was prepared. He had the Boy Scout model. He had everything ready to go just in case. And then God put somebody in his path that used the preparations that 
he took care of to tend to another. Guess what, folks? If we are earnestly seeking a relationship with Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, and we are diligent to study our Bible and to pray and to become friends with others that will help sharpen us, He is preparing us for just such a situation that when it presents ourselves, we will have all the resources that we need. And so when that person needs to hear about the redemptive love of Jesus Christ, and we can look into our reservoir of stories and know where we have fallen in the past and how God has lifted us out of that mire and brought us up out of the pit and placed us in front of a holy God and says, He is one of mine. I know His name. That is one of my sheep. We will have all the tools that we need. We don't know when that victim will be placed right in our path where we have our bags packed with the bandages and the the gauze and all that kind of stuff to treat their wounds. But we know that those times will come. And each and every one of us will have a different opportunity in life to either share a cup of water or the gospel we will know when to do each one but there is a catch we will only see the victims we will only see those that God has placed in our path if we have diligently sought his will in our life daily when we seek his will we will see through the eyes that God has given us through the eyes of the cross We will become like this Samaritan who will see a need and fill it. But if we are not filling ourselves up with the will of God, we will never see it. We will have blinders on. We can justify, oh, I think that was just a dog, so I got on the other side of the road. Not knowing it was ever a human life. It is easy to justify ourselves as this lawyer was seeking justification for his limitations on who a neighbor was. We can find the loopholes. You look at Karen and say, there's loopholes in the law, isn't it? Plenty of loopholes in the law. If you have enough money, and we can see it on the news reports, if you have enough money and get the right people in place, you can find them. You know, you look at justice in our society, and it's really lopsided. We can talk about democracy and all this kind of stuff, but when you look at the statistics, if you have resources, you can use resources. We have a church with resources. And I'm not just talking about our individual church. God has blessed us, and he has given us everything we need to be a witness to this community. I'm talking about the church in the United States. We are a rich church, but yet, spiritually, we are starting to falter. Morality in this country are suffering. What used to be a sin is no longer a sin. It's just a matter of interpretation. Well, it's easy to interpret things when you ignore them outright. So if you want to be able to find the will of God in your life. If you want to base your life on the wisdom and not of that of the fool, you need to seek God first. Turn your life over daily to Him. You must deny yourself, as Jesus told His followers, and pick up your cross. A cross isn't easy. If life is just sailing along for you, what are you missing? Now, each and every one of us will go through seasons of our lives. One time, we were all children. Some of us are are more advanced than others. But if you still draw breath, God has placed in front of you 
something to do. It could be departing the wisdom of your life. And maybe you have more regrets than few. But maybe it is in the redemption of those regrets that you can steer someone away from their own. God has placed in front of us a challenge this year. The book of Proverbs gives us two directions. Do you want to be wise or do you want to be a fool? We make those in every decision of our life, even in the mundane details. From what we eat to did we brush our teeth, all these little things that we take for granted, they point us in one direction. Let's talk about habits. Let's talk about New Year's resolutions. Why do we have them? Most of us have given up on them years ago. But it's because we want to improve something in our life. Habits are great, and they're our worst enemy. Good habits set us in the right direction. Bad habits point us in the wrong direction. And one thing you will learn, if you try to revamp everything in your life in one moment, you will fail. If you've never exercised before, never watched what you eat, and you decide today I'm going to get in shape, so I'm going to start training for a marathon, and I'm going to cut my calories to 1,200 calories a day. If you have enough strength and willpower, you may get a few days into it. But you're going to fail. So look at your life. Look at where you're at. God is calling you to change something in it. If he wasn't, you wouldn't have been here today. So start with one thing. Maybe it is to join us with our scripture reading this year. Maybe you've never read through your Bible, never read through the New Testament all at one time. That's what we're going to do. As many have appreciated reading the Proverbs together, we are going to now turn and read the New Testament together as a church. And I know some of you have made a a discipline of reading through the Bible every year. Stay with it because you're going to catch up with us eventually. But if you've never read through the Bible together, start easy. One chapter a day. If you get behind, it's not that big a deal. But try to keep up. Read those chapters. If you miss a few books, just start where we're at. Just hang with it the best you can. And I promise you, you will have no regrets. So as we head to that new series, I ask you to pray for me because it is preaching by lot, by the dice. Each week is based on the Sunday it lands, starting in Matthew, ending in the last book of Revelation. So some Sundays, the sermons will just be right there. And there's some, I pray that it doesn't land on a genealogy. We will make our way through that together. So join with me. Let's grow together. Because one of the things that you will find with Christianity in this country is that more and more people are biblically illiterate. They claim Christ as our Lord and Savior, but their decisions are based on what the world has taught them. They don't base their choices on what the Scriptures teach us how do you know what's in the scripture you got to read them if you have trouble seeing the words on your page guess what there's an app for that there's free ones you bibles one of my favorite multiple versions of the bible right there at your fingertips if you want reading plans all that kind of stuff right there it'll even read to you in many translations so there's no excuses But if you want to know what God's will for your life is, see what he's left us. As we learn reading through the Proverbs, they won't necessarily all be a direct correlation to our life today. But they will point us. They will use this discipline of common sense that we talked, and they will let us apply it to our lives. 
But if we don't seek God's will for our lives, we're going to find at the end of this year more regrets than few. So let me pray for you today. Our good and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that you have allowed us to come into your house to study your words. Lord, we are thankful that you have challenged us through the scriptures as we read Proverbs together as a church. And as many of us will finish that book over the next few days. Lord, I ask that you guide us, that you give us the strength that we may follow the path of the wise and avoid folly and follow with the destruction of the path of the fool. Lord, I pray for everyone here today that they may find a blessing in the life that is lived following you because we know that it is the only life that truly offers hope and peace in this world that we find so isolated and alone. Be with us, be with us as we leave here today. Watch over us, protect us, Give us discerning eyes so that we may see those that fall in our path that you have given us the resources to care for. And give us the strength that we may return and pay the bill for whatever else may be needed of us. It is in your name we pray. Amen. And now as we enter this time of invitation. If you have found Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior and you've never been able to, to share that with others and you'd like to do that today, please come forward. If you've been visiting First Baptist Church and today is the day that you're no longer going to just be a visitor but one who is a member, a brother and sister with this body, please come forward. Or maybe something about today touched you and you need a word of prayer come forward at this time.